Hey everyone, welcome back. This video is going to be slightly longer than the other ones for this week because uh, I want to get this all down in one video. Uh, so we're going to talk about Moore's proof of an external world. So G.E. Moore looked at skepticism, looked at the arguments for external world skepticism, and then tried to prove that we do have knowledge of the external world. He tried to prove that there is an external world, thus showing that we have knowledge. So I'm going to go through Moore's proof. Then we're going to ask if it's really a proof, which is a, the bulk of Moore's, what Moore's paper is about. And then we're going to ask whether the proof's actually convincing. So Moore's proof. Well, Kant said that it was a great scandal in philosophy that we don't have a proof of the external world. And this is what we talked about in the last video towards the end. If someone doubts the external world, we have no way of convincing them. Once you doubt that your experience of the external world is true, there's no way to convince yourself or for anyone else to convince you that it really is true. And Kant thought that was a great scandal in philosophy. That was a problem, that we don't have a proof of the external world. We don't have a proof that the external world, as you experience it, is real. And that seems crazy. We should have a proof. We should be able to prove something as basic as that. Uh, and Kant said, it still remains a scandal to philosophy that the existence of things outside of us must be accepted merely on faith. And that if anyone thinks good to doubt their existence, we are unable to counter their doubts with any satisfactory proof, if you want the direct Kant quote. So Kant tried to provide such a proof, but it was pretty unanimously uh, didn't work. Everyone after, who came after Kant pretty much agrees that it wasn't a successful proof. So we're not even gonna talk about it. More thinks that Kant's proof didn't work. And so G.E. Moore, who G.E. Moore is writing in like the early 20th century, think like 1910, 1920, that area. Moore intends to provide a proof of the external world. He wants to prove that there is an external world, that things exist outside your own mind, and that they are roughly what you take to exist outside of your own mind. Thus solving Kant's problem, avoiding philosophical scandal, so on and so forth. So. Here is Moore's proof that there are external objects, that there is an external world. Because remember, this external world is just the sum total of all the external objects. It's just every, all the things that exist outside your mind. Here's Moore's proof that there are external objects. Premise one, here is a hand. Premise two, here is another. Premise three, Therefore, there are at least two hands. Therefore, there are at least two external objects. Therefore, there is an external world. All right, and that's Moore's proof. Here's a hand, here's another. Therefore, there are at least two hands. Therefore, there are at least two external objects. Therefore, there is an external world. That's G.E. Moore's proof that there is an external world. So, that's his proof, but he says he can give lots of proofs. He says, it seems to me that I can now give a large number of different proofs, each of which is a perfectly rigorous proof, and that at many other times, I've been in a position to give many others, many other proofs. I can prove now, for instance, that two human hands exist. How? By holding up my two hands and saying, as I make a certain gesture with the right hand, here is one hand, and adding, as I make a certain gesture with the left, here is another. And if, by doing this, I have proved ipso facto the existence of external things, you will all see that I can also do it now in numbers of other ways. There is no need to multiply examples. All right, so G this is the actual direct quote from G.E. Moore. And G.E. Moore says, look, Here's a hand, here's another, therefore there are external things. Clearly I could do that with lots of stuff. Hey, there's a chair, there's another chair. All right, therefore there's at least two chairs. Hey, here's a foot, here's another foot. Here's a friend, here's another friend. Therefore my friends exist. 
like you can do this with lots of different things ge more things the hand thing was just an easy example but there are lots of examples more things you can offer lots of different proofs of the external world but that's an awfully that's an awfully short simple easy proof uh, you might start to wonder is it really a proof and well more thinks it is right more gave this lecture and published this paper saying a proof of the external world clearly he thinks that it is a proof of the external world and he spends a lot of time arguing that it is really a proof so if we want to ask whether or not it's a proof first things first we should probably ask what a proof is so what is a proof what does it mean for something to be a proof we talk about proof sometimes i need you to prove this uh, in court lawyers have to prove their client is innocent prosecutors have to prove the defendant is guilty mathematicians have to prove theorems we use proof a lot so what is a proof well a proof is an argument that proves that its conclusion is true right that makes sense a proof is an argument that proves almost trivial uh but so what does it mean to prove that something is true so a proof is a certain kind of argument that's the first thing we're saying here a proof is an argument that proves its conclusion is true so what does it mean to prove something how does an argument prove its conclusion as opposed to just sort of more loosely like supporting its conclusion or what how does it prove its conclusion well to prove that something is true you have to show that it's definitely true beyond a doubt it is true with absolute certainty so how do you prove that how do you do that how do you get an argument to prove its conclusion this is what mathematical proofs do they show mathematically using agreed upon steps and inferences that the conclusion must be true given the axioms of whatever zermelo frankel set theory or euclid's axioms of geometry or you know whatever axioms you're starting with this conclusion can't possibly be false it is definitely unequivocally true a proof of the external world needs to demonstrate beyond a doubt that there is an external world so how do you do that how does an argument prove its conclusion is true well more claims that in order for an argument to be a proof there are three conditions there are three conditions for being a proof and more thinks that each of these conditions is necessary and that together these conditions are sufficient so more is offering a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for a proof for an argument to count as a proof it has to meet all of these conditions and once it does it's a proof so what are these conditions these necessary and sufficient conditions well condition one is that the premises must be different than the conclusion right the premise has to be different than the conclusion of the proof the proof can't be circular basically for example there is an external world therefore there is an external world right that's not a proof that's a circular argument the premise of the argument is just the same as the conclusion so that's a valid argument and maybe it's a sound argument if the external world really does exist but it's not a good argument it's not a proof it doesn't show that its conclusion is true because it assumes with its first premise that the conclusion is true so the argument is circular it begs the question and that's not a proof so for an argument to be a proof condition one is that it can't be circular the premise must be different than the conclusion and so that's all the first condition is the proof can't be a circular argument condition two 
is that the premise is something that you know to be true rather than something you just believe but aren't sure of or something that happens to be true but you don't know is true. So like a Gettier case belief can't be the premise because you don't know Gettier case beliefs. They're true and you've got some justification, but that's not good enough for a uh, proof more things you have to for an argument to be a proof you have to know the premises are true you have to know the premise you can't just believe it you can't even just have a justified belief in it or just have a true belief in it you have to know it you have to know that it's true so you can't just say brains and vats are impossible therefore i'm not a brain and a vat because we don't know that brains and vats are impossible. We can still doubt that. It still seems like they are possible. It seems like they could happen, at least in theory. And so if you can doubt the premises, the way we might doubt that it's really impossible for there to be a brain in a vat, then you can still doubt the conclusion, right? An argument is only as good as its premises. If the premises can be doubted, then the conclusion can be doubted. So the argument isn't a proof if you can still doubt the conclusion. And that means the argument isn't a proof if you can still doubt the premises. If you don't know the premises are true, then it's not a proof. Anything less than knowledge of the premises leaves room for doubt. Room for doubt of the premises and therefore room for doubt of the conclusion. There can't be any room for doubt. You have to know that the premises are true in order for an argument to be a proof. That's condition two. Condition three is that the conclusion really does follow from the premises. In other words, that the argument really is valid, right? For an argument to be a proof, it has to be a valid argument. You can't just say, well, uh, two plus two equals four. Therefore, there's an external world, right? Because that is not a proof. That's not a good proof. But it meets the first two conditions, right? P condition one uh, is that the premise and conclusion be different. And the premise and conclusion certainly are different here. Two plus two equals four is a very different claim than the external world exists. Those are different. So it meets condition one. And you do know the premise. You know that two plus two equals four. You know that for sure. Even external world skeptics think you know basic math because that doesn't rely on sensory experience. You can in your head just sort of do math without relying on your senses. So it satisfies condition two. The premise and conclusion are different. So it satisfies condition one and you know the premise. So it satisfies condition two. And yet this still is not a proof. Why? Because the premise and conclusion are totally unrelated. The premise gives you no reason to believe the conclusion at all. The premise could be true, even if the conclusion weren't, which is another way of saying the argument's not valid. So even if you were a brain in a vat, two plus two would still equal four. The conclusion just doesn't follow from the premise here. The argument is not valid. And so condition three is that the argument has to be valid. And so those are the three conditions for Moore's, for, an, for a proof. Those are Moore's three conditions for an argument to be a proof. Can't be circular. Premise and conclusion got to be different. You have to know the premises can't just believe them and they can't just happen to be true. And the argument has to be valid. The truth of the premises has to guarantee truth of the conclusion. If an argument meets those three conditions, Moore says, then that argument is a proof. If the argument fails to meet any of those conditions, Moore says, then the argument is not a proof. So each individual condition is necessary for proof, proofdom. And together, those three conditions are sufficient. So let's suppose 
Moore's conditions for a proof are correct. They seem perfectly reasonable. Uh, I don't have any objections to them personally off the top of my head. So let's suppose that they're correct. What does that mean? Does that mean that Moore's argument counts as a proof? Or another way to phrase it, does Moore's argument meet these conditions? Moore thinks that it does. Moore thinks his alleged proof satisfies all three conditions. Condition one, the premise must be different than the conclusion. Well, here is a hand is different than there is an external world, certainly. And the claim that there is a hand here says something very different than the claim that there is an external world. So they really are not the same claim. They are not just making the same thing, but phrasing it, making the same claim about the world, but phrasing it differently or saying the same thing with different words. They really are truly different claims about what the world is like. There is an external world could be true even if here is a hand wasn't true. If you weren't holding your hand up and had your hands behind your back or if you didn't have hands, there would still be an external world. So the claim that there is a hand here is not the same thing as the claim that there is an external world. When you say here is a hand, you mean something very different than when you say there is an external world. Right? If you say there's a chair here, you aren't saying the external world exists. Because if you say just to strangers, the external world exists, they'll say, uh, 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 okay. Uh, but if you say, oh, there's a chair right here, you know, if they're looking for a chair or something, they'll go, thank you. And then they'll sit in the chair. You've communicated very different information by saying each of those sentences. So they really are different, right? The premise really is different than the conclusion. So condition one here is met. What about condition two? Condition two says that you have to know the premises. You can't just believe them, but not be sure. And they can't just happen to be true, but you don't actually know that they're true. You just believe that they're true. You have to know that they're true. So do you know that there is a hand here when I hold up a hand and say, here's a hand? Or when you hold up a hand and say, here's a hand? Well, Moore thinks, yeah, you know that. Moore thinks that when you hold up your hand and you say, here's a hand, you know that you're right. You know that you're right with as much certainty as you could possibly know anything. Here is a hand is what David Lewis, a philosopher uh, who was taught at Princeton uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, David Lewis called this a Morian fact. And he said, quote, it's one of those things that we know better than we know the premises of any philosophical argument to the contrary. So you know, here is a hand, more things. Right? A Morian fact is a claim that you know to be true and that you know with more certainty, with more confidence than you could possibly know any philosophical argument to the contrary. So Moore thinks, look, ask yourself, what are you more sure of? Are you more sure of the fact that you have hands or of the fact that there are no errors anywhere in the skeptic's argument? What are you more certain of? That you have hands or that the skeptic's argument is flawlessly sound? Moore thinks if you're really honest with yourself, it's the hands thing. That's, that's what you're more certain of. You are more certain that you have hands than you are that the skeptic's fairly complicated philosophical argument is flawless. The right answer is obviously that you're more sure you have hands, more things. And so you should be more sure of the claim that you have hands than you are of the claim that it is possible that you're a brain in a vat or that a brain being sent electrical signals from a computer would have the exact same experience as a brain sent electrical signals from sense organs, or that a brain sent electrical signals would, uh, you know, have all of the same evidence as a brain sent signals from 
sense organs. Like all of those claims that the skeptic makes, more things you should be less confident of than you are confident that you have hands. You should be much more confident that you have hands than you are that all of those sort of heavy philosophical claims are right, are true. And so Moore thinks that you should conclude, yeah, you do know that you have hands. What could you possibly be more certain of than the fact that you have hands? Moore thinks that that is the thing you should be most confident in here. Of all the things we've talked about in these lectures, the claim you should be most certain of is there is a hand here when you hold up your hand. And so more things you do, in fact, know the premises of his argument. You know there's a hand here when you hold up a hand. You know that. And so the second condition of his conditions for an argument to be a proof is satisfied. So you do know the premises of his argument. So conditions one and two are met. So condition three is that the conclusion really does follow from the premises, meaning that the argument really is valid. And well, hands really are external objects. And so if there really are hands, then there really are external objects. And if there really are external objects, then there really is an external world, right? Hands are external objects is true. So if, there are, if it's true that there's a hand here, then it's true that there's an external object here. And the external world is just the sum total of all the external objects. So if there really is an external world, then there really are, or if there really are external objects, then there really is an external world. That's true. So if the hand really is there when you hold up your hand and say, here's a hand, then it exists out there in the world. It's not an idea or some kind of mental object. It's not like a thought you have. It's a physical thing that exists outside of your mind. So if there's a hand here, then there is an external world in which that hand exists. So there must be an external world. So the conclusion of this argument really does follow from the premises. It's just built into the meaning of hand that they are external things. And so it really does follow from here's a hand that there are external objects and therefore that there is an external world. So the argument really is valid. So Moore's proof meets all three conditions. It's not circular. Moore thinks you do know the premises and, more, and it, the argument is valid. Now the controversial part there is not one or two. It's everyone pretty much agrees that the argument's not circular and it is valid. Uh, so all the controversy is on whether or not the argument actually meets condition two. Uh, condition two. That you know the premises. And so the question now is, is the proof convincing? And if not, why not? Because most people say no. Historically, in the last hundred and... 100 plus a handful of years since Moore gave the lecture and wrote the paper, a lot of people have said no. The majority have probably said no. And Moore thinks that one reason people say no, that no, this proof is not convincing, is that they want him to prove things that he has not proved or even tried to prove. For example, they want him to prove the premises that he uses in his proof. They want him to prove here is a hand and here is another. But he does not prove that. He does not provide any proof of the premise here is a hand. And he explicitly says he doesn't think it's possible to provide such a proof. He says, if this is what is meant by proof of the existence of external things, I do not believe that any proof of the existence of external things is possible. And you might think, hey, 
you said you were going to prove that there are external objects, and now you're saying that if you mean proving that there are external objects, then that can't be done. That's impossible. So what the what the heck? You might think that by acknowledging that, Moore is just giving up. He's just saying, all right, look, I can't really prove that there are external things, but I can kind of do it in this little fun, snarky way. Like, look, here's a hand, there's another, therefore they're external objects. Of course you know there's a hand. What's wrong with you? Which is kind of what he does. But Moore doesn't think he's just giving up and being snarky. He says, and here's a long block quote, how am I to prove now that here's one hand and here's another? I do not believe I can do it. In order to do it, I should need to prove, for one thing, as Descartes pointed out, that I am not now dreaming. But how can I prove that I am not? I have, no doubt, conclusive reasons for asserting that I am not now dreaming. I have conclusive evidence that I am awake. But that is a very different thing from being able to prove it. I could not tell you what all my evidence is, and I should require to do this at least in order to give you a proof. So he says, look, I have conclusive reasons for saying I'm not dreaming. I have conclusive evidence that I'm awake. But the fact that I have this conclusive evidence does not mean I can tell you what it is. It doesn't mean I can articulate that evidence. And I would have to articulate that evidence in order to prove it. So I have conclusive evidence that I'm awake, but I just can't articulate what all the evidence is. It's just sort of there. So Moore is saying he can't prove his premises that he has hands, and he can't prove that he's not dreaming. But he thinks he doesn't need to. He thinks he has conclusive evidence for his premises, enough to give him knowledge, and that that should be enough to use them as premises in a proof. His point here is that you can know something. You can have conclusive evidence for something. You can know that it's true without being able to prove that it's true. You can have knowledge without having a proof. The fact that we can't prove that we have hands does not by itself show that we can't or don't know that we have hands. The absence of a proof is not itself a proof that we don't have knowledge. The absence of proof does not mean the absence of knowledge. You can know something without proving it. And so Moore thinks he cannot prove that you have hands, but you still know that you have hands. You have conclusive evidence, even if you couldn't even begin to say what it is. And that, Moore thinks, is enough for us to use those claims that we have hands as premises and a proof of the external world. And so Moore thinks that even if we can't prove we have hands, we know that we have hands, and we can therefore use that knowledge to prove to ourselves and others that there is an external world. Maybe you think that's successful. Maybe you think it's not. You'll have a chance to tell me in this week's weekly assignment. And if you have any questions, either about this material or about the weekly assignment, please let me know, and I will do my best to help you in any way I can. If not, great, and I'll see you in the videos next week.